Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwenza Garden in Ireland and I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas and Happy New Year. So you're welcome back to the channel and to kick off I have a beautiful treat for you today because we are going to visit a beautiful garden in South County Dublin in September when it's lovely and sunny and there are so many flowers and beautiful things to see. Now this garden is called Airfield and what I absolutely love about it is not just its subtropical planting which is quite impressive but it has an amazing array of annual flowers that will just gladden your heart not to mention whimsical hedging and a kitchen garden that warrants a video all of its own it's not a separate video it's in this one but my goodness it would really want you to take up growing some veg and fruit and wonderful things so come with me and let's visit Airfield Gardens Airfield Gardens is an old estate situated in Dundrum, County Dublin. It's been open to the public since 1999 and came to prominence under the leadership of renowned plantsman Jimmy Blake. The gardens have changed over the years, but in 2012 were redeveloped with notable input from Chelsea gold medalist Arabella Lennox Boyd and designer Dermot Foley. I love this garden room for its softness and lightness of planting. It's full of vibrancy and movement from the grasses and tall perennials that flutter in the breeze. There's a glorious froth of flowers in pastel colours and clever use of numerous varieties of annuals. Airfield is just over six acres in size and contains diverse spaces ranging from an ornamental walled garden, shade gardens, glass house spaces to an extensive organic fruit, vegetable and cut flower garden. The temperate climate of South Dublin allows for an extensive range of plants. It roughly translates to US hardiness zone 9, but hardiness zones aren't something we generally use here in Ireland and our climate doesn't exactly fit with their parameters. I do hope I'm not making you dizzy with my 360 degree turn on this garden room, but I just wanted to show you the crisscross of paths and the extent of the planting. You'll notice quite a bit of topiaried hedging here, but we'll have a look at those in a few minutes. The zinnias are really eye-catching and we'll see more of these as we tour around the other areas of this super garden. But just look at what perfect flowers they are. I was reminded of what star zinnias can be and one of the first things I did when I got home was to order some packets of annual zinnia seed for sowing this spring. Maybe we'll sow them together in a video. It seems I'm not the only fan of zinnias however because this hard working and methodical bee was determined not to miss any single bit of pollen at all from the zinnia bloom. There's such a range of unusual annuals here from Cleome, which also went into that seed order once I got home, to unusual varieties of marigolds and cosmos. There are plenty of dahlias too. Annuals are just so flexible and when used well can completely change the character of a flower bed from one year to the next. In most of these beds, you can pick out the permanent perennials or bushes, which provide the bones of the display. But even the best perennials and bushes seldom flower for all summer long. Whereas the annuals, well, that's just their forte, and they provide colour all summer long. It's September now, and one late perennial that's working hard is this persicaria. Its tall red spires add a lot of architecture as well as colour and movement. There are pots too. 
Lots of pots with grasses in this part of the garden. I must say I really enjoy how different grasses are used in different situations throughout. Intriguingly, this pot holds a black colocasia on top of frothy grasses. Pity I didn't get a proper look at how this was managed culturally, as grasses nearly always require well-drained soil, but colocasia loves moisture. Although unusual bedfellows, they look superb together. There are shady areas too, and here bright foliage lifts the darkness. Hostas, of course, make excellent pot plants for shady areas, if you can keep them watered and the slugs off. And now, let's take a look at the whimsical hedging that makes such a quirky backdrop to this garden. Lots of dark green yew is used, some bushes clipped into spirals that mark the ends of borders, and others just providing a dark green foil behind plants. Traditionally, yew is used at the back of herbaceous borders because it shows off plants so well, but there's nothing traditional about the asymmetrical clipping of these hedges. They add such a random fun element to the garden that couples well with the lightness and airiness of the planting. Note also how none of the hedges are allowed to grow too high so they don't block light from the beds which are mostly full sun. It's now time to move into another section of the garden, but we haven't left the topiary behind. This section is flanked by cloud pruned box bowls. I love how these box bushes are clipped so that they melt together in soft cushions. Here, the gardeners make it look effortless, like these bushes just decided one day to grow together like this. But don't be deceived. A lot of hard work has to go into clipping these every year. This section of the garden contains long herbaceous borders with beautiful planting and again, good use of annuals. However, the plant that really struck me here with its beauty was the gorgeous Peruvian feather grass or Stipa Ichu. We can see the similarities between this grass and its better known cousins, Stipa gigantea and Stipa tenuissima. Stipa ichu, however, has very long slender plumes that are silvery white. The plumes are arching and tumble forwards in a shimmering mass that, for my money, overshadows most of the colourful planting in this bed. The grass is repeated along the extent of the border, which is always a great technique to add a sense of cohesion. Stipa ichu, or Peruvian feather grass, grows in full sun or part shade in moderately fertile to well-drained soil. It's slow growing. I think perhaps the soil in this bed was a teeny bit too fertile for the grass because it needed some staking in places. This can be a problem when you mix grasses and perennials together in a bed and enrich the soil for the benefit of the perennials. However, the Peruvian feather grass looked absolutely amazing and I'm definitely on the lookout for seeds so I can grow it in my own garden. There's such a vibrant mixture of annuals, perennials and grasses in these long beds that it's hard to know what to focus on, so I'll give you a taste of what's there. Some plants are unusual and some are quite common, just beautifully grown. I could spend many hours here, 
But let's take a look at a section of planting at the top with more tender things. We have ricinus, the poisonous castor oil plant, which makes an amazing addition for its glorious foliage. And we have a tall, soft pink salvia. Now this one is really furry and fluffy if you look at the detail of the flowers. And Bhutan, I think is the name, but I'm not altogether sure. An absolutely gorgeous one. Again, not something I could grow outdoors in my garden in Wexford, although in theory we're the same hardiness zone. There are calmer areas too to sit and contemplate the planting. But there was also a glass house in this garden room, a beautiful old looking thing jammed with plants. Unfortunately, a quick inspection showed the sign that makes me so sad, staff only. From the door, it did look like there wasn't much space in there for visitors to circulate, so I understand the sign. The glass house holds Brugmansia, Colocasia, Pelagoniums, fuchsias, succulents, and lots more. One takeaway from this pretty greenhouse was how the Saracenia were planted in the same pot as short ferns. They made a very attractive combination. Now we must climb the stairs to visit another calm, shadier area where good use of grasses is in evidence. I adore the squirrel grass, Hordium jubatum, displayed in old fashioned milk churns. I used to grow this annual grass for years and always loved it. Maybe it's time to do that again. The grass along the path is Haconocloa macra, one of the few shade loving grasses. At the top, in a position of full sun, we have a fabulous combination of succulent aeoniums planted in among wavy grasses. The arrangement was just magical. The aeonium area draws us over, but then if we look to the left, a path comes into view. It's planted with grasses, annuals and perennials, but the specimen tree over on the left really draws the eye. This is the strawberry tree, Arbutus unado, but actually I think it's a hybrid between the hardy strawberry tree and one of the more tender varieties. It has the most polished bark that shines in the sunshine and its little bell-like flowers dance in the breeze. in the borders here relies heavily on tender salvias, rudbeckia, abutilon and gaillardia. There are plenty of annuals too adding to the colours. I wonder if the sheltered nature of this path allows the gardeners to overwinter some of these plants without protection. The grass here seems to be pheasant's tail grass or anamantala and at this time of year, it's producing its pull away haze of seed heads. The real star of these borders is the golden Rudbeckia. Rudbeckia is also known as coneflower or black eyed Susan, and it'll steal the show in anyone's garden from late summer onwards. 
perennial Rebecca tends to be yellow flowered like we see here, whereas those grown as annuals are available in a wider color range with shades of yellow, orange, dark red or brown and more complex flowers. The hardy perennial Rebecca we're looking at here is dead easy to grow. It does need full sun, but it'll grow in most soil types, so it's a must-have plant for beginners and experienced gardeners alike. All Rudbeckias are native to North America, and many species and cultivars are cultivated in gardens for their showy golden flower heads that bloom in mid to late summer. They work well in prairie planting schemes, but as you can see here, they work equally well in mixed borders or even as specimen plants. Finally, Rebecca is loved by insects, so a great one to grow if you want to attract beneficial pollinators into your garden. I'm not the kind of gardener who let an impressive specimen go unremarked. So here's a look at a monstrous agave planted in the ground. Can they leave it out over winter? If so, I'm deadly jealous. I have to show you one more fun hedge, and here it is. This hedge is much taller than the last ones, providing lots of shelter to the surrounding plants. It's made of clipped beech. But our visit to airfields isn't over yet. I've yet to show you the amazing kitchen garden. To give it its correct name, this is the organic food garden. This section of the garden is two acres in size and is organically certified, producing a bounty of organic food for various markets and outlets. The garden is used also to educate visitors about the range of crops that can be grown in the Irish climate. There are many fruit, vegetables and edible flowers on display and it's just wonderful to think that all this food is grown without the use of chemicals or pesticides. So as we take our final look around I'm sad to say that our visit to Airfields Garden is coming to a close. I've really enjoyed showing you around this beautiful garden. Sorry if I mentioned the word beautiful too many times in the intro, but perhaps you can understand why now. This garden is a wonderful space to explore, and beside the obvious attraction for hardened gardeners like myself, there were many families and young children enjoying a day out. I hope if you're in the vicinity, you'll pay Airfields a visit too. Thank you for coming along with me on this garden tour and I hope you'll join me again when I show you some incredible gardens in the Canary Islands off Africa. Have a wonderful day. Bye.